Zechariah 9, 9, when you have it, say, I got it, Bishop. Follow along with me. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So far, the scripture. I want to speak to you for a few moments, and I'm going to move a little bit today. But I want to speak to you from the subject based on this first part of the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. <laughs> I want to speak to you for a few moments from the subject, a champion in your corner. A champion in your corner. Bow your heads. Be Father, bless this word. Charge it with your power. Help your son today. Help your son. God knows you know I need your help. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Woo! Presence of the Lord. I got to move, so let me move, move with me. Move with me. If I was to ask you the question, what is your favorite city? What would your answer be? <laughs> what is your favorite city in all the world, in all of the cities of the world? What is your favorite? Some people would say Brooklyn. Some people would say Paris. Some people would say Rome. Some people would say L.A. Or, or, or Chicago. Can I tell you that God's favorite city is Jerusalem, the holy city, Zion. Of all the cities in the world, some are bigger, some are more beautiful, some are brighter, but of all the cities in the world, God's favorite city is the city of Jerusalem. Somebody say Jerusalem. Sometimes it's called Zion in the scripture. Now, give me a moment. I want to define for you, for those of you that read the scriptures and, and maybe you, you get confused. When it comes to Zion, the Bible talks about three different things being Zion. There is the city of Zion, which is Jerusalem. There is the mountain of Zion, which is the mountain upon which it's built. And then there are the people of Zion. Depending on the context, Zion can talk about a city, it can talk about a mountain, or it can talk about people. Sometimes when we're praising God, you hear me say, come on, Zion, give him a praise, because you are the people of Zion. Somebody say Zion. You need to understand that the culmination of all the world's events is going to happen in Jerusalem. Lean in and listen. What we're seeing now going on in the Ukraine with Russia is a prelude to what has been prophesied. The king of, of, of Magog is going to come against the nation of Israel. All that we're seeing now, listen to me, I'm not going to get uh, uh, too deep, but, but all that we're seeing now are the birth pains that Matthew 24 spoke about that's going to head towards signs that lead us to the end of the world. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but I'm saying those of us that are believers, we can see my, uh, 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 all of the, 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 the movings of the things are coming together. Gog and Magog, are you with me? So, so now most people, listen to me, most people don't know anything about it. They are looking at the current events and thinking, oh, uh, Putin's going crazy. No, Putin's being moved by the devil to begin the pangs that's going to end up, listen to me, the world's great events are going to all come central to not New York, not Paris, not London, not Rome, not Istanbul. It's going to come to Jerusalem. The culmination of the age is going to happen in Jerusalem. Armageddon! happens in Jerusalem. 
those of you that have been with me to, 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 to Israel, we stood on the plains and we were able to overlook the valley of Armageddon, which right now is peaceful. But the Bible tells us that when World War III comes, that, that, that the, the forces of the north and the forces of the, of the, of the west are going to come together and they all are going to come together against Israel in the valley of Armageddon. It happens in Israel. Are you with me? The second coming of Christ happens in Jerusalem. When Christ comes back, he's not coming to New York. He's not coming to Las Vegas. He's not coming to Los Angeles. He's not coming to Rome or London or Paris. When Christ comes back, he's coming back to Jerusalem. His feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, and, and you got to understand, yeah, so those of you that haven't been there, when you've been there, you see when, when the Muslims took over Jerusalem in an attempt to, 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 to nullify the, the prophecy of God that Jesus was going to come back down on the Holy Mount where the Temple Mount is, they built a, a, a cemetery on the eastern slope of the Mount because the scripture says that, that the, the priest can't touch a dirty thing, or a dead body. So in their attempt to stop the second coming, they have built a cemetery on the eastern slope of the Holy Mount. But what they don't know is that God knows how to break any curse that they have. I got to move on. So Armageddon happens. Uh, 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 uh. The, 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 the second coming happens. Listen to me. The thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus happens from Jerusalem. I know I'm, I'm dealing with some eschatology. Some of y'all look at me like your heads are scratching, but just, just, just walk with me. After Jesus comes back, there, at the second coming, he will then set up a government for, in Jerusalem that will rule the world. And for 1,000 years, when Satan and all of his evil imps are thrown into the pit of hell for 1,000 years, on earth, Jesus Christ will rule the world from Jerusalem because Jerusalem is God's holy city. Jerusalem is the set. That's why, that's why. You ever wonder why, why every now and again something flares up in Jerusalem? This small plot of land, this small piece of land that, that no bigger than New Jersey, it controls all of our lives. Because when something breaks out in Jerusalem, the whole world stops. When something breaks out in Jerusalem, the whole world is affected. Why? Because it's God's holy city. Revelation tells us that when, when after the, the battle with the dragon and God and, and Jesus defeats the devil and finally puts him and hell in the pit of fire, that's too much to deal with, Douglas, that at the end of all of that, Coming down from heaven is the city of the new. It's not the new New York. It's not the new London. It's not the new Paris or Las Vegas or Los Angeles. It is coming down from heaven when everything is being set up the way God always intended it to be. And those of us that are saved... who have confessed Jesus as our Lord... When we come back down and we reign on this earth, coming down is a new Jerusalem. Somebody say amen. Notice, I said, he doesn't choose Jerusalem because it's the prettiest city. I've been there. It ain't that pretty. He doesn't choose it because it's the best or the most beautiful. He chooses it because he decided to love it. It's the same way he chose you and I. Even though we're not the best, not many mighty, not many noble, not many. We didn't come from, from a great pedigree. It's not like we have a whole lot going for us. But he chose us just because he wanted. I need somebody to give God a praise that he chose you. I need somebody in this place or wherever you are to give him a praise. Because you know you ain't got it all together. You know you got some mess in you. But in spite of who you are, he chose you. What's interesting to me is that even today, even today, the city of Jerusalem, by the way, the, the name Jerusalem means the city of peace. It's amazing that the city of peace, even today, 
operates under a, a, a culture of subdued violence. Because at any time, an attack can break out in Jerusalem. This city of peace is always in a state of threatened war. Because when God loves something, the devil hates it. Somebody tweet that out. That's good right there. When God loves something, the devil hates it. Let me make it a little better. When God loves someone, you ever wonder why you go through so much hell? When, 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 when you, you figure, I'm not that great. There ain't not that much going. Yeah, I know, but you got to understand this. You are loved by God. And because God loves you, the devil hates you. And because the devil hates you, he's going to do whatever he can to try to disrupt your life. But here's what the devil got to understand. Once he's chosen me, he's put something in me that no matter what comes my way through hell and high water, I'm not leaving. Now, now that I know what it's like to be loved by God, it doesn't matter what comes my way. I'm going to hold on to the horns of the altar. As a matter of fact, because he loves me, he's made me a prisoner of hope. And I'm able to hope in the Lord. Things aren't going well today, but baby, I hope in the Lord. There's some trouble going on in my life, but that's all right. I hope in in the Lord. Are there any people in here who, like we talked about last week, are prisoners of hope? Uh, who say, I'm so glad that hope got a hold of me. Mm. So even today, in the 21st century, the city of Jerusalem is under siege. It's a subdued siege. But every now and again, it flares up. And we hear about it. In our text, the city is in a mess. In our text, the, the city of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, and the people of Zion are in a mess. They have come back from the Babylonian captivity after seven years. They've come back to Israel. They come back to Jerusalem, and what they see breaks their heart. No doubt when they left, they were excited. We're going back to Jerusalem. We're going back. And yet they get there and Jerusalem is decrepit, is dilapidated, is beaten down. No one has really lived there or cared for it. And it is a mess. Ha have, you ever, have you ever had your heart broken? Where you have expectation of something and your heart is broken. That's what's going on in our text. They come back and their heart is broken. They were expecting. They come looking, thinking it's going to be glorious because if God made a way for us to come back, he certainly has got some great miracle. And they come back and Jerusalem is a dilapidated junk heap. And they look at what they see, but God challenges them. And says, I know what you see, but I do not want you to believe what you see. I want you to grab on to what I say. Can I tell you, it is your responsibility. Nobody can do this for you. You've got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Let me say it again. Somebody's watching, need to hear this. you got to learn how to walk by faith. And listen, every day is a challenge to your faith. You, you might have showed some faith yesterday, but be careful because you woke up this morning on the wrong side of the bed. And you got to know every single day the devil is coming after your faith. That's why your hope is so important because we know that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, the, the thing you need faith for is the thing you are... Is there anybody in here or anybody watching who is hoping for anything? Is there anybody in here or anybody watching who who's had... There's something you want, but it's just out 
of your grasp. If you could have grabbed it, you won't need hope for it. But you're, somebody in here, God told me to tell you again, I am watching where you are, and I want you to believe what I say and not what you see. Is there anybody in here crazy enough to throw up their hand and say, Lord, that's me, that's me. I'm, I'm going to believe you what you say in spite of what I see. Throw up your hand and say, Lord, here I am. Move, move. Okay, okay, okay. The city's in a mess. And in verse 9, God does something that he always does that drives me crazy. I don't understand why he does it. God always speaks to you the positive while you are at the lowest negative point of your life. Sometimes I wish God would just get down and wallow in the mud with me. Come on, see, y'all know y'all, y'all feel that way. Oh, God, come on, Lord, say, yeah, you a mess, yeah, ain't nothing w- working, yeah, nobody love you, yeah, it's never going to get no better. Some, that's what, but God never, somebody say never, never does that. In the midst of your worst situation, he always speaks a word of peace. He, wor- he speaks a word of prosperity. He speaks something that when you hear it, you say, you got to be kidding and in this text, in the midst, they've come, if you read verses 1 through 8, I mean, God is talking about all the, all the mess that's going on and the things that's going to happen. But in verse 9, he interrupts all of that. Is it to say, yeah, I know about that, and I know about that, and I see that, and I see that, but that's not what I want you to focus on. Verse 9 says, rejoice greatly. It's a mess, but rejoice greatly. Now, the word there, rejoice, it means to jump up and down. It means to spin. It's the kind of thing you do when your team won the championship. You, you, you've seen those, 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 those pictures of when the team win the championship or the win the game at the last minute, they run down and they jump and it's, yeah! That's what God wants for you in the midst of your mess. Now, see... It takes a special person of faith to rejoice greatly when all hell is breaking loose in your life. It takes a special person of faith to rejoice. Notice, he doesn't say rejoice alone. Rejoice means to jump up and down. It means to spin around. It means to to, to celebrate. But he says, don't only rejoice. He says, rejoice. God, why you got to make it so hard? I mean, it'd be one thing for you to tell me to rejoice, but you're telling me to rejoice greatly. But let me tell you something. The reason God tells you to rejoice greatly is because he knows what he's going to do for you. And so, 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 so before he does it, th- 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 my first point is this. He is called commanded praise. Listen, God says, I don't want you to praise because you feel like it. I don't want you to praise because it looks good. I am commanding praise. I want you to praise because I've told you to praise. I need some people. Now, this may not be everybody, and it might not be some of y'all watching, but I'm going to give you a few seconds to give God some praise, not because you feel like it, not because everything is good, but I wonder, are there anybody in this house who will do what the Bible says, which is to rejoice? Jump up and give God a praise. I know you don't feel like it, but it is called commanded praise. You don't got to like it. You don't got to feel it. It's not emotional, but the Bible says jump up, open your mouth, and give God some commanded praise. Somebody do it now. Don't just wait. Some of y'all need to jump. Some of y'all need to jump because that's what it says. Your jumping says to God, I believe you. You're jumping, says to God, I trust you. Somebody give God some commanded praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on and pray. Don't, don't, don't stop yet. Come on and praise him. I know you don't feel it. Ain't no reason to do it. But the Lord has commanded it. Open your mouth. Jump to your feet. Spin around and give him some commanded praise. Oh, oh, hold up, hold up, stop, 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 stop. The reason some of y'all can't do it is because you have been brainwashed by Eurocentric worship, which tells you when you come to church, you sit down and you're quiet and you're respectful. Can I tell you something? The quieter you are in church, the more disrespectful you are to God. 
Read the Bible. God says, when you come before me, shout. When you come before me, dance. When you come before me, clap. Because God commands praise that in spite of what I see, I'm going to do what he says because I know praise will bring about the results I want. I need you to take one minute and give God some commanded praise. Come on, I don't want no music, I want to hear you. I don't want no music, I want to hear your voice. Open your mouth and give God some commanded praise. Rejoice greatly. Shout, that's what it says. Rejoice greatly. I need a shout. Somebody give me a Shabbat. Open your mouth and shout. Shout! Shout unto God. That's what the Bible says. Shout unto Not some man from Europe. Do what the Bible says. Command and praise. Shout! All right, sit down. You ought to praise God the way you handle work. There's some days you want to go to work, and the other days you don't want to go to work. On the days you don't want to go to work, you know what you do? You go to work. There's some days you want to cook. Some days you don't feel like cooking. But you got them children. And when you don't feel like cooking, you know what you do? You cook. Well, there's some days I don't feel like praising. But you know what I do? I've learned a long time ago. I told you, I've been doing this for 40 years. I've learned a long time ago to praise him even when I don't feel it. It's called the sacrifice. Some praise is not a sacrifice. When all things are going good and when the Lord is moving and everything is fine, you got money and you and honey are doing well. Well, you don't mind praising him, but the, the best praise is the sacrifice of praise. I don't like what's going on in my house. I don't like what's going on in my body. I don't like what's going on in my job, but I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's commanded praise, but I'm going to praise him. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to praise him. I don't like it, but I'm going to praise him. Somebody give him one more shout. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I got to move. It's right there. It's right there in the text. In the middle of all the mess going on, he says, don't look at what you see. Listen to me. Rejoice greatly. And then he says, shout, O daughter of Zion. Why? Because your king, not just as your king is coming, but your king is coming to you. Hold up. Deal with it, Douglas. The first point is commanded praise. The second point is a crowned potentate. Now, now, when I was studying, I, 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 I love this word. This word is not a word that's used very much in the English language anymore. The word potentate. Say it with me, potentate. It means someone who has amazing or un, unspeakable authority. Someone who's got ridiculous amounts of power. A potentate. That, that, that they, are, they are so powerful that whatever they desire, they can get. And, 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 and the, the text says, he says, look, your king is coming. He, listen, he's not coming to be kinged. He's coming already king. He's not coming to be crowned. He is already crowned. Mm, 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 mm. 
In other words, and we know that, that, that Jesus was born a king. That's why when the wise men came, they said to Herod, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come. There's that commanded praise again. Notice, notice, notice. He is already, he is the crowned potentate. In other words, the, the, the Lord we serve, he's no weakling. He's no, he's no afterthought. He's no second. No, no, no. He is the crowned potentate. What do you mean? I mean that he, he comes as king. That's why on, on this day, on, on Palm Sunday, when he comes in, he came in and they hailed him as king. Hosanna! Save us! Because we know you have power. Hosanna! Save us! Because we know if you speak it, it will come to pass. We know that your words will never fall to the ground. We know that your word will never return to you void. We know that if you say it, it will happen. Why? Because you're the God that cannot lie. And whatever you speak, is there anybody here or anybody watching who's glad that he's got power? power so that when he speaks it might not happen as quickly as you want but I have found that when God finally moves it works out better than I could have ever worked it out myself do I have anybody in here who will say looking back over my life when God moves he always knows what to do when to do it how to do it his ways are not our ways his thoughts are not our thoughts. And I, I trust him because he is the potentate. Move on, Douglas. Move on, Douglas. Move on, move on. Move on. He's the crown potentate. He says, rejoice. Your king, he's coming unto thee. Take your finger, put it in your chest, say, he's coming to me. He's coming to me. He's coming to me. Why, why is that critical? Because he can be the potentate and not care about you. See, here's a marvelous thing about being saved. Not just that God is the king or Jesus is the king. Here's the thing. It's that the king loves you. The reason we praise God the way we do is because he, yes, he's king, but he could be king and not care about you. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me. When I think about all the messes he's brought me out of, when I think about all the crises I've been in, now, some of them I thought were going to kill me. Somebody here or somebody watching, you're in the middle of something you think going to kill you, but hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> he is coming for you. He's going to help you. He's going to make a way out for you. Somebody lift up your hand and say, me, Lord. So I call this third point, I call this third point the committed protector. Here's why. Here's why. Because when you understand the king got power, and yet he's coming to help you in the midst of the mess. Now listen to me. Everything around you is a mess, but he's coming to help you. Everything around you is not working, but he's coming to help you. God, I feel, I feel prophetic right now. Somebody in here, my Lord, I'm talking right to you. Somebody who's watching, I'm talking right to you. The committed protector is coming to help you. So that's why we can say things like, if God be for us. Oh God, I want, I want to help somebody. If God be for us, who can be against us? I wonder, am I talking to anybody right now? I want to remind you that he is a committed protector. He's committed to protecting you. It's a mess, but he's going to protect you. It's not working out, but he's going to protect you. Why? Because he's a committed protector. Somebody say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean, Bishop? I mean that right now with whatever you're dealing with, if you will learn how to give commanded praise, if you'll understand that he is a crown potentate, if you'll understand he's your committed protector, what can the devil do to you? When you understand who Jesus is and how he loves you, when you understand who Jesus is and the power he has, you are able to stand still and understand no matter what comes my way, I have the victory. I want to tell somebody in here or somebody watching, you have the victory. Somebody shout, victory is mine. 
No, 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 no. Shout, victory is mine. Nah. Shout it again. Victory. Is... Would you look over at your neighbor, just wake and tell him, victory is mine. So I came to tell you, you have a champion in your corner. Wait, wait, wait. You have a champion in your, what does that mean, Bishop? It means no matter what happens, he's with me. Whithersoever I go, he's with me. It means no matter what's going on, he's helping me. It means no matter what's happening, he's guiding me because he is a champion in my, what does it mean to have him in your corner? That no matter who's against you, the Lord is more with you than the world against you. Let me tell somebody that I came to announce over your life as you go into this new week, you've got a champion in your corner. You are not alone. You're not by yourself. Tell the devil, don't mess with me this week. I've got a champion in my corner. Tell the people that hate you, leave me alone because I've got a champion in my corner. Would you do me a favor and tell God, I, I want to thank you that I've got a champion in my corner. Come hell or high water, I've got a champion in my corner and it doesn't matter what people try to do i've got a champion in my corner it doesn't matter what the devil tries i've got a champion i need somebody put your hands together and give this champion a praise wait a minute wait a minute i want you to go with me real quick to the book of hebrews hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter, chapter 12, verse number 2. We, 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 we know it. I'm going to read it in two versions. The first version is the King James. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of of the throne of God. My God, if you grew up in Sunday school, that's one of those verses that hits you every time. Looking unto Jesus, he's the author and finisher of our faith. But I want you to read the same text in the New Living Translation, which says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion, that is, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. There it is. He is our champion. I want to tell you, I'm getting ready to close, but I want to tell you, you need to be confident in your champion. Let me say it again. You got to be confident in your... The only place in the Bible where the word champion is used is when it comes to Goliath and David. Where the Bible says the Philistines believed in Goliath, their champion. In other words, when they came, you know the battle, because they said, you send out your champion and we'll send out our champion. And whoever wins, that's going to be the victor. Well, Goliath came out as the champion of Gath. But when the champion of Israel, when the champion of Zion a little boy by the name of David, when he finished doing what he do, the Bible lets us know Goliath laid down on the floor and had his head chopped off because their champion can't hang out with our champion. And I want to tell you, if you thought David was a champion, hear the word of the Lord. Jesus is your champion. Now, I want to tell you, Jesus uh, is the one who's fighting for you. And I want to let you know that wherever you are right now, you're coming out uh, and you're coming out with a championship pedigree. Uh, I want to tell somebody who's in the middle of a difficult situation, hear the word of the Lord. Uh, I'm bringing you out uh, and I'm bringing you out because I'm your champion. Uh, I'm bringing you out uh, and you're going to be victorious. Uh, tell the devil, uh, leave me alone. Uh, I got a champion uh, on my corner. I want to tell somebody who's waiting on God here, the release that God sends you this week. You've got a champion 
and your champion is going to do for you what no other champion can do. He's going to bring you out. He's going to make a way. He's going to turn around. I release your miracle. Somebody in here, you are believing God for a miracle. Hear the word of the Lord. Your champion has already provided all that you need. Somebody shout, my miracle is here. Somebody shout, my breakthrough is here. Because I came to tell you that no matter what it looks like today, you got a champion. Somebody lift up your hand and shout, yeah. I'm finished. But if you'll permit me, I want to introduce to you your champion. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. In this corner is the undisputed, undefeated, reigning champion of the universe. He hails from heaven by way of Bethlehem. He has taken out and defeated the vilest, meanest, nastiest, dirtiest villain of all time. He's known by many names. King of kings, Lord of lords, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's known as the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's known as the bread of life and the day spring from on high. He's known as savior, redeemer, Lamb of God, Alpha and Omega. He's also known as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But he is best known by the name that is above every other name. The name that makes demons tremble and sickness run away. The name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to present to you our champion. I present to you Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the champion in our corner. He is the sovereign on our side. And you owe him a praise because of who he is. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice and praise him now! Yeah! Come on, come on! Come on and praise him! He's your champion! Come on and praise him! Yeah! Somebody shout Jesus! Shout Jesus! Shout Jesus! No other name! Jesus! It's got power! Jesus! Cause he is our champion! Throw up your hands one last time! Open your mouth one last time! And praise him! My God. I'm, I'm finished. I'm finished. Re remain standing if you can. Join us if you can. Listen to me. He is the champion on our side. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care the mess. He is champion. 
Can't nobody beat him. They've tried. Can't nobody best him. They've tried. So now, your only thing is to, hey, relax. He is the champion in your corner. But, 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 but Bishop, you, 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 know, you know how bad it looks. Ah, 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 ah. Hey, hey, can I tell you something? There are people that have had it look worse than you. And he's come through. You know why? Because he is the champion in your corner. Listen, bow your heads with me. I want to pray. Father, I thank you. Because, Lord, I just want you to know that we receive this word today. That you indeed are the champion in our corner. And I want to release right now, for those who are in a mess, looks like a mess. No way out. No remedy. But that's all right. You are our champion. And we rest and rely on you. Because we know that when you move, can't nobody stop you. When you decide to fix, it can't stay broken. And so we release you right now by faith. And we say to you, we will wait on you until you do what you're going to do. And while we wait, we'll wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And we let our hearts be strengthened so that we don't give up hope in the middle of the fight. Matter of fact, we can't give up hope because we are prisoners of hope. Bless us, we pray. Woo! I gotta let you go. Put your hands together one more time. Give them some praise.